I'm Emil Salvini, author and historian, and these are Tales of the Jersey Shore. Today we're in front of the New Jersey Maritime Museum located in Beach Haven, New Jersey. In the era from the colonial days until the early 20th century, the coastline along the New Jersey shore was known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Thousands of ships and 10,000s of lives were lost, often within sight of land. Something had to be done, and in the mid-19th century, the United States Life Saving Service was created. Until it was absorbed into the United States Coast Guard in 1915, these brave storm warriors saved hundreds of thousands of lives and thousands of ships loaded with cargo for the new country. Their story is often forgotten, but they're an important part of New Jersey's maritime and America's maritime history. And today on Tales of the Jersey Shore, we're gonna tell their story. Most of the New Jersey coastline was barely inhabited from the era between the American Revolution and the turn of the 20th century. Small villages dotted the regions between the larger towns. What I think is amazing is that it all started here in New Jersey. New Jersey before the late 1600s was not populated. There was no one here. Henry Hudson came in what, no, what we now know as Barnegat Inlet, and the Indians probably looked back at him and thought, who is he? And he thought, who are they? And he backed up, and that was the first sign of anyone coming to New Jersey. Many residents that carved out an honest living did so as fishermen. While fishing was dangerous, backbreaking work, King Neptune would sometimes deliver his wonderful bounty for free after a storm. Bluefish, shad, and moss bunkers were loaded into bushels, small boats, and wagons. Sometimes the storm would give up a sad bounty. The unwritten law along the coastline that a ship that met an untimely demise along the graveyard of the Atlantic, the Jersey coast, was fair game. Cargo, timber, and other valuables could be claimed by those that discovered the wreck. Living along the desolate coastline sometimes tempted the less scrupulous of the inhabitants to resort to a despicable practice called wrecking, known as moon cussers because they required a pitch dark stormy night to ply their trade to cause the death of hundreds of poor souls and the loss of many fine sailing vessels. Most of us have heard of moon cussers. Uh, children's stories have moon cussers. We call them moon cussers because land pirates who were responsible for luring ships ashore did not ever operate under a full moon for fear of being detected. They didn't want their nefarious activities to be seen by the um, better uh, residents of their communities. So they, they didn't want to get caught in the act of luring ships ashore. Back then, uh, it seemed in many ways, uh, the, the, the beaches were deserted. It was every man for himself. And uh, legend has it that a, uh, a group called Wreckers uh, would come. And it was their feeling that a, a ship shipwrecked along their coast, the contents, the wood, and in many cases, sometimes the people's clothing was their property too. Bands of wreckers like invading ants would converge on a wreck site, stripping everything of value, often including the personal belongings and clothing of the hapless victims. The worst of the moon cussers were rumored to lure ships to their doom and help Mother Nature along. They would walk a mule with a lantern tied around its neck up and down a stretch of dark, lonely beach during a nor'easter. The captain of a ship, in the grip of the deadly storm, would mistake the moving light for another ship and misjudge the distance between his vessel and the shoreline. Another victim for the wreckers. Wreckers were a minor problem compared to Mother Nature. Shiploads full of raw trade goods traveling to and from the new nation and immigrants seeking a new life in America fell victim to horrific storms on a regular basis. You also had ships involved in what they call the coastal trade. And they went literally from Florida to Maine, carrying lumber, carrying glass, uh, local products back and forth. So you had all these ships going past New Jersey. Which plays uh, one of the roles in why New Jersey has so many shipwrecks. Downstairs in the shipwreck files, we have over 7,200 documented accounts of shipwrecks in that 127 miles of coastline. That's a tremendous number of documented wrecks in such a small area. 
but the fact that there was so much shipborne commerce heading to those three major ports of entry played a significant role in that number. You also had ships coming from Europe and they were looking for New York Harbor. They were the immigrant ships loaded with people coming to this country. While powerful merchants demanded an organized life-saving service, it was the appalling loss of life that drove the public to demand action. Volunteers manned inadequately equipped, sparsely located humane stations, but thousands of ships continued to wreck. In 1854, the Powhatan ran head-on into the remnants of a three-day blizzard, and the newspaper carried stories of the 260 to 300 men, women, and children that washed ashore off Long Beach Island. Some were buried in unmarked graves. As the shipwrecks and loss of lives increased monthly, the government first used naval vessels and then the Revenue Marine Corps took over the patrolling duties. More than 4,000 wrecks in a short period of time emphasized the dangers of the sea and something had to be done. Well, what many people don't know is that the U.S. Life Saving Service, or today's Coast Guard as we know it, actually evolved from a singular act of a man who later became governor of New Jersey, William Augustus Newell. Newell was really uh, an exceptional man. Uh, he was educated uh, and uh, really one of, the, uh, one of the leader, I would say, in founding the U.S. Life Saving Service. And he happened to witness the shipwreck and he saw the bodies the next day and he realized there was nothing he could do to help these people. And this man, who also had a home in Manahawkin, um, which is today the Shin Funeral Home, William A. Newell was a doctor, a practicing doctor in Manahawkin, also had a home in Allentown, New Jersey. And Dr. Newell witnessed a shipwreck on the beach of Great Swamp known as Surf City today. So he liked to take walks, and he found it out he liked the shore. He liked to walk up and down the shore in all kinds of weather. And on one particular summer, uh, it was August of, uh, I believe it was 1839, he had just graduated medical school and was down in Long Beach Island and, and happened upon, during a hurricane, this man was out during a hurricane, and happened upon a shipwreck. It was the Count uh, Terresto. And he watched his 13 men aboard this ship tried for hours clinging to the mast of the ship, hoping, praying for rescue. He was totally taken by the whole thing. Uh, the men and women, just a couple hundred yards off the shore, uh, screaming and yelling, the waves were pounding, the wind was blowing, and there was, there was nothing that could be done. And he saw the bodies the next day, and he realized there was nothing he could do to help these people. It was too far gone. It was too late to help these people. Sadly, there was nothing that Dr. Newell could have done because at that time, the means to save someone clinging to a mast hadn't yet been perfected or ever utilized off the coast of New Jersey. And here they are only a couple of hundred yards away, and ultimately they all died. I believe it was over a half a dozen crew members, and it stuck with him. Uh, being an educated guy, a scientist, he said, something has to be done. We've got to come up with some sort of intervention to try to save these people. It had a profound impact on Dr. Newell, and he made it his mission to seek appropriations from the government for the purpose of designing life-saving equipment so that such an event would never again have to be witnessed without the witness being able to do something to try to save their lives. So he had political connections and he went to Washington and he said, we need money to help people. As each ship sank, pressure mounted on the government to take action. Some officials felt the government had no business in the life-saving business, but by 1870, when the James H. Hoyt wrecked off the twin Navasink Highland Lighthouses and the crew met certain death, Newell's dream became a reality. Congress realized that the brave lifesavers needed funding and real organization. William Newell, when he became a member of Congress, was able to get attached to a lighthouse bill on appropriation of $10,000 for the purpose of 
providing life-saving equipment to aid mariners off the coast of New Jersey. He served 1847 to 1851, and it was in there that he felt he had uh, uh, the power to do something about creating such a service, a life-saving service. And he started the U.S. Life-Saving Service with $10,000 from the government. Uh, he promoted a bill in uh, January of 1848, freshman congressman, to construct a series of uh, life-saving stations along the beach, manned by volunteers, uh, to go out to patrol the beaches and it, it intervene when there was a shipwreck. It was the first appropriation of its kind in the United States, and it eventually resulted in the formation, the formal formation of the U.S. Life Saving Service. So, in effect, this singular shipwreck off New Jersey had more of a role in the creation of the U.S. Life Saving Service than any other event in the United States history. The New Jersey coast received a paltry $10,000 appropriation thanks to Congressman Newell for miscellaneous equipment, including lifeboats, lifeguards, rockets, and some wooden shacks that were used as stations. In 1850, the New Jersey coast was devastated by a nasty storm and many vessels were wrecked. One though, the Ashire, proved that the stations were a good investment as 201 people were rescued using the new life cars and other equipment. Well, that appropriation enabled people like Joseph Francis and others to design life-saving equipment such as the Joseph Francis life car, the Lyle gun. It enabled um, enterprising young men in the day to create the means by which these people could be saved. And that's how the Lyle gun, the life car, and other pieces of beach apparatus came into being. Actually, it was Newell who came up with the idea of shooting some sort of projectile out to the ship to try to gain contact with the ship by which you could get the apparatus back and forth from the shore. These men had the financial incentive to design methods by which shipwrecked mariners and passengers could be rescued, as in the case of the Count Paresto that William A. Newell witnessed. That was the name of the shipwreck. With most wrecks breaking apart within sight of the mainland, a system and equipment were invented to solve the deadly problem that plagued lifesavers for a century. How to transport people to shore from a stricken vessel, sometimes just hundreds of yards from land. The first miracle was the Lyle gun, invented by Army Captain David A. Lyle. It was a 175-pound cannon designed to shoot an 18-pound lead projectile over 600 yards. A line was attached to the torpedo-shaped projectile, and once it was attached to the ship, progressively heavier lines and cables were pulled aboard. And it would be rigged like a pulley system between the ship and the shore. And that would establish a lifeline between the rescuers and the people on board. No easy task to hit a ship being torn apart by a ferocious storm, often at night or during a blizzard. So the surfmen drilled weekly with targets on the beach. The next thing they would do was re uh, rig up something that they called a breeches buoy. Breeches coming from the word breeches being pants. And that's exactly what it was. It was a life ring with a pair of canvas uh, pants attached to it. And they would send that out to the ship and one by one, they would rescue somebody. Although that was well and good, in many cases, it wasn't enough, saving one person at a time. So a man named Francis came up with something called the life car. And uh, that was a secure little box that could fit four people in it. Uh, and that way they were able to uh, evacuate more people rather than just the one up to four people could go. And he rigged this thing made out of corrugated metal all uh, riveted together and it could hold four or five people and they would lie horizontally one on top of the other and they could be brought into shore. So consequently you had people being rescued four or five times as fast as they would have with the breaches buoy. The only problem with the Joseph Francis life car is if the last person into that life car did not properly secure the hatch, 
the, uh, this corrugated metal uh, container would fill with water while the people were being dragged ashore and sadly they would drown because they had no way out. The stations in New Jersey, located in the 5th District, were full life-saving stations with a crew of surfmen and a keeper. They were constructed in a variety of styles but could accommodate all of the equipment and the living quarters for the men from November through April. Initially, uh, Newell's funding uh, from Congress was for only eight uh, in the beginning. Only eight were built every three miles, starting in Sandy Hook. Well, New Jersey at one time had uh, as many as 42 life-saving stations from Sandy Hook to Cape May. The, the Jersey coast, as we know, extends 127 miles. So between Sandy Hook and Cape May, those 42 stations were established at a distance of about three miles between them. And from there it grew. There was, uh, one, was, uh, there was one in Seabright, a life-saving station. There was one in Monmouth Beach. There was one in Long Branch. Uh, on down the row, all the way down. Link, uh, this is primarily uh, uh, Newell's uh, congressional district, which pretty much covered the coast of New Jersey from Sandy Hook to uh, Little Egg Harbor. And of course they were conspicuously placed in, in areas that allowed the men who occupied and, and patrolled those areas of beach the best opportunity to see a, sh a ship or a shipwreck on the beach. The service used three types of stations. The first, used predominantly in the Great Lakes, was the lifeboat station, where heavy boats were launched directly into the water. In Florida, it was thought that ships that came aground on beaches in isolated areas would not need life-saving crews, but food, water, and comfort. Unmanned houses of refuge were constructed along the shoreline. The first station built in New Jersey was the Spermacetti Cove Station in Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Since the U.S. Life Saving Service was eventually absorbed into the U.S. Coast Guard, it is thought to be the first Coast Guard station in the United States. In 1876, a model station was constructed for the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. It was later moved to Cape May, where it served for a time as their station. A new structure eventually replaced it and the beautiful Victorian-style station was used as a storage facility. Well, they vary, but much of the architecture was standardized. Sadly, most of the life-saving stations that once existed are gone. Um, we have a few here. We have the Long Beach Station that's still here. We have the Bond Station. We have the Barnicut Light Station that now doubles as a municipal building. But um, most of those 42 stations are gone today. One of the first steps the service took was to create uniforms for the station keepers and surfmen so they could be distinguished from marauders or wreckers. With stations every three miles along the New Jersey coast, a simple but effective method was devised to ensure the surfmen patrol their stretch of beach. Two surfmen would head to each other's stations as they kept a close eye out for vessels in distress, and when they met halfway, they would exchange checks or a tag with the station's ID stamped on it to prove to the station keeper that they completed their task. The life-saving service had a, a very effective system of ensuring that the patrols covered their part of the beach. Back then, uh, of course, uh, communications were very limited and uh, the members of the life-saving service uh, was their duty to patrol the beach 24-7. They had to be there day and night in all kinds of weather and uh, to make sure that the men were doing their job patrolling their area, they had a series of checkpoints uh, along the beach. So what they would do, as an example, a man from the Barnegat Light Station, they call it the Barnegat Station, would walk south carrying one of these, what they call checks. And this would have the district and the station number. The man at the Harvey Cedar station would walk north. And if both men were doing their job and covering their respective territories, they would meet in the middle. Each man would walk about a mile and a half, meet in the middle and exchange these checks. So each man would go back to his station with the other man's check, proving that he covered 
the territory. And it was a very effective means of making sure that that three miles of beach was covered by those two men. It was rigorous, it was very difficult, uh, not an easy job. And again, it's amazing to me that these were volunteers for the first 25 years uh, from the initiation of the Life Saving Service towards this official organization. Volunteers uh, did this duty of, of the checks. The storm warriors were told to test the surf and never give up. They would fearlessly charge to the side of the wrecks wearing their cork vests, ready to launch their lifeboats into the stormy sea. Records show that they would make numerous attempts and never give up. By 1915, the United States Life Saving Service was absorbed into the U.S. Coast Guard. But for half a century, these storm warriors routinely tested the surf and risked their lives for strangers. They lived for months at a time in isolated stations. No matter if they were exhausted or sick, they waged war on King Neptune in the worst weather possible with no hesitation. It was not unusual for the men to return to their station hungry and injured, only to be called to another wreck. They would eventually fade into history as more powerful ships using radar, GPS, and accurate weather forecasts would permit captains to navigate the dangers of well-charted coastlines. The men of the U.S. Life Saving Service were a special breed, true storm warriors, the armed men of the seas with nerves of steel. Every breath of their life was a brave act, but incredible men uh, and just regular men. These were regular guys uh, who did uh, incredible acts of bravery and they were recognized with medals. And if you look out on the, on the ocean, I think of what happened here over the last couple hundred years. I look out there and I see four-masted schooners going by in my mind. I see the Morrow Castle on fire in the middle of the night. I think about what happened. Hope you enjoyed the story of the United States Life Saving Service and the fearless storm warriors. This is Emil Salvini, Stay tuned to NJTV for more tales of the Jersey Shore.